Now here are my key messages. I'm just going to quickly read these through to you, just set a context, and I'll remind you of them at the end. So the first message uh, is that like all animals, our habitat, human habitat, is a determinant of our habits, the way we live, and thereby our health and well-being. For thousands of generations, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers. They were living among nature, getting plenty of exercise and eating a pretty natural diet. Currently, we're in the midst of a global urban transition, as I've just pointed out. Since 2008, cities are now the dominant human habitat internationally. Most of us live in cities. Urban ways of living can be very sedentary, very, uh, we don't necessarily get a lot of physical activity. And the modern diet, the food we eat, uh, can be far from natural. Uh, the chips and the, the sodas and the chocolates that we're confronted with in the supermarket, often the first things we're confronted with are not natural at all and the, it follows that they're not healthy. And globally, we now confront epidemics of obesity, diabetes, these non-communicable diseases like heart disease, lung disease, cancers, and importantly, depression and anxiety. So the key message, the final dot point, is that it's time to rethink the way we plan, design, develop and manage our cities to protect and promote our health in sustainable ways. So I hope I'll be able to persuade you when we come back to look at these six dot points at the end uh, that these are really important challenges for us all. Now just uh, history will be a bit of a theme as we go through. So if we think about history uh, of uh, the work on health and cities, here's a couple of touch points, just two examples. Uh, Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath, which is the foundation of the practice of medicine. When Hippocrates was alive in Greece about 400 uh, BC, he wrote a, a, a treatise called On Airs, Waters and Places. And he was one of the first people uh, to put those words on paper about these important links between the places we live and our health and the things we need to do to assure our health into the future. Uh, the, later on, the Romans, uh, in developing their large cities, uh, Rome, one of the first cities uh, with a million people in the world, uh, they introduced things like public baths, aqueducts, they drained the marshes to deal with the mosquito-borne diseases. So it's not a new thing to be thinking about health and cities. We've been doing it for millennia. If we come a bit closer uh, to the present day, in the 1800s in industrial England, when there was that phase of rapid urbanisation, it was associated with epidemics of infectious disease and respiratory disease from overcrowding uh, in the houses, the lack of uh, sanitation, as Anwar said, uh, uh, the Broad Street pump story about cholera epidemic uh, in London and the controls that needed to be put in place, uh, the respiratory diseases from the polluting industry uh, that uh, was in the cities at the time. So, Health reformers in that era included Edwin Chadwick, who was a social uh, reformer, a lawyer uh, by background, and he established the Health of Towns movement to protect the health of people. And indeed, it was interesting that while there was initially resistance to some of the changes required, eventually industry, the chieftains of the time, the people that owned the factories, came on board because they were finding that their workers were getting sick and they were much less productive. And so it was in the interests of industry uh, to introduce these healthier ways of working and living in cities. In, uh, subsequently, Ebenezer Howard, the, uh, the urban planner from England, proposed this idea of garden cities. And uh, this was the idea that if we moved people from the crowded inner cities out into areas where there was more space, uh, trees, opportunity uh, uh, to enjoy fresh air, then people would be healthier. And of course, that made a lot of sense at that time. 
Indeed, I think uh, Penang has a connection with the Garden Cities movement because Francis Light, uh, who was here, um, is connected with Adelaide in Australia, which is one of the classic examples of uh, um, a, a garden city. Uh, more recently, UNESCO, of course, we're here in a wonderful UNESCO heritage town, but UNESCO, the UN organization, uh, has developed a program called Man in the Biosphere in the last few decades. It's about thinking about our future, our future as people, in the context of the broader planetary environment that we uh, rely upon for our health and well-being. And Stephen Boyden, who was a very eminent uh, human ecologist in the 1970s, did work in Hong Kong on the ecology of Hong Kong and the people living there. And I point you to that work because it was really foundational work on connecting the health of people and place from that ecological perspective. And it's still worth referring back to his work. I still meet with him regularly whenever I'm in Canberra, where he's currently based. He's well in his 80s at this time. And then it was Stephen's work that really kicked off uh, the uh, WHO Healthy Cities uh, movement led by Leonard Dull, Alona Kickbush, Trevor Hancock and others. Uh, and uh, we, we, in Malaysia, we have, uh, I think, um, Kuching is one example of, of the healthy cities that are so identified under the WHO program. Now, another way of thinking about history is this schematic on the rise and fall of the urban health penalties from a developed country perspective, uh, for example, a Malaysian perspective. And you can see here, this, uh, along this uh, horizontal axis, we've got the time uh, from the 1800s through to now and into the future, the phases of industrialization that I was referring to before, modernization through the 20th century to globalization where we are now and into the future. And up here, an indicative uh, health risk or health impact. What over time have been the big health challenges? So it was the infectious diseases, as we heard before from uh, Anwar, and that because of the work of pioneering people like Dr. Wu, we now have uh, effective ways of controlling many infectious diseases. We're concerned about the rise of some new ones, uh, but we've, we've substantially got the infectious disease things under control at the moment. We have had major problems um, with air pollution over the centuries, particularly during that phase of industrialization and modernization. We now have very significant transboundary problems here in Malaysia and, of course, in China, uh, where our colleagues are based. Uh, great concern now. The World Health Organization has declared air pollution a crisis. So while it has come under control in the developed country experience, uh, it's a major problem uh, in, in our emerging economies. Road trauma, uh, very important. Uh, uh, motor vehicles, very important. Source of in injury. We've introduced controls, engineering, behavioural controls, use of seat belts. We've improved the design of motor cars. But we could be healthier if we had less contact with motor cars. And I'll come back to that later. But uh, the the emerging challenge that Anwar has referred to, I know many in, in this audience tonight are concerned about in Malaysia, is the problem of obesity and all of those attendant health problems. And it's tracking with this rising uh, consumption, both at the societal level and at the individual level, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Clearly, this is not sustainable and we must change. Here's some data just to remind us that obesity is a major problem uh, here in Malaysia. Data from the WHO Collaborating Centre for Obesity Prevention. And you can see here Malaysia highlighted as uh, one of the highest prevalences in, for Asian countries in overweight and obesity. Enormously important issue. And we need to do much more about that. Now, I'd like uh, 
to bring, bring us back to make that connection between contemporary cities and human health. And this report from our colleagues in the United States, I think is very helpful in getting our head around the modern experience. Smart Growth America is an NGO, a non-government organisation in the United States that advocates for a rethink of patterns of urban development in America. And in the early 2000s, about a decade ago, uh, they did a piece of work on measuring the health effects of urban sprawl in the United States. They developed an index for how spread out cities were by looking at the lot sizes and the distances between things, how far we had to travel, and they correlated that with people's health outcomes. And what they found was that people that lived in spread out areas of cities uh, got less physical activity and they weighed more than people that lived in more compact areas where things were nearby. And when you think about this, it makes good sense because in spread out areas, the only convenient way to move around is using the motor car. And so you end up relying on the motor car because it's the only way to get around. Whereas if you lived in, for example, the heritage part of, uh, of Penang or another part of, uh, of this wonderful city, the way, where you could walk to shops and services and do your daily business by walking, cycling, wheeling yourself around, then you get that what we call incidental physical activity just in the way we live. You don't have to go to the gym at the end of the day because you've built it in uh, to the way you're living. And this, this was a very important piece of work. It didn't show causation, but it showed us that there was a need for more emphasis in, in this area. And indeed, in Australia around that time, I was working with a government architect in Sydney, and we developed uh, this document, which is still freely available on the internet. It's a collection of 11 papers on the range of links between our urban environments and our health. It covers things like air pollution, water quality, uh, injury and safety, physical activity, food security, and importantly, mental health and well-being. Because there's connections between place and social capital, social connection, the way we, we um, relate to our neighbours, to others in our community, and our mental health and wellbeing. This was a conference, uh, to, uh, a photo of a group taken outside the Australian Academy of Science in Australia, uh, that space age building there. You can probably tell it was built in the 1960s when it was the era of space, space science. But this was a group of 100 of us uh, uh, standing in front of that meeting. Uh, and we had spent two days focusing on this important theme of urbanism, environment and health. Urbanism being the way we live in our cities. The impact on planetary systems, the broader environment, and the impacts on human health and well-being. We brought together scientists, with policy makers, with people from civil society, with people from industry, to wrestle with this important challenge in Australia, which is a microcosm of what we face internationally. This slide, a very busy slide, and I don't expect you to see all the words on it, it's a slide about the links between health and urban transport systems. And it was showed in the introductory speech of that conference. And what you can see here is that there's a lot going on. When we think in depth about the links between urban transport systems and our health and well-being, if we start on the left, we, the transport system in a place like Penang partly reflects the history of the place, of course, but importantly, it also reflects our planning values, preferences, and theories. We inherit it in the past, but we change it and we evolve it. And at the moment, we've just opened a new bridge to the island recently, which in one sense is an enormous positive, but if it just brings more cars into Georgetown, that's not a, not a good outcome. We have to make sure we manage that uh, more effectively and provide good mass transit options at the same time so that we're not all required to use the motor car for our daily lives. So uh, over here on the left, you know, when we're talking about this transport system and what it ends up looking like, 
Whatever it is, the mix of modes, the way it works, will have energy consequences and consequences for associated infrastructure, which will have flow-on effects for air pollution, greenhouse gas emission, noise, road safety, and importantly, how walkable the place has become. You know, you, you can get great severance from busy roads and as you walk around this wonderful city, uh, those two three-lane roads, one in each direction, you kind of take your life into your own hands as you, as you try and cross them. And I think, think City would be interested in, uh, in how we might manage that and, uh, and think differently uh, about the city and the way we move about it. And the reason we really need to do that, one of the important reasons, is because of these health reasons. And you can see here, all these things in red are the potential negative health effects of transport systems that aren't working well for people. Respiratory disease, asthma, cardiovascular disease, fetal impacts uh, before uh, babies are even born, stress, you know, many impacts, including social impacts, not just at the individual level. A lot going on, really important that we think carefully about that. And one of the things that came out of that, uh, that meeting, and I won't dwell too much on this because I suspect it might be quite hard to read at the back, but we tried to put a bit of order into our thinking. So we went into the meeting with those complicated slides, but we came out with what we call a framework for thinking about urban sustainability and our health. And so on the top axis of this grid, we... Uh, divided what constitutes a city into six broad domains. The economy and the work in the city, the transport and urban form, uh, the, uh, the buildings and the housing, uh, the, oh, even I can't read it and I'm very close to it, <laughs> the nature and landscape, I think, uh, the media and communication and the cultural and spiritual dimensions. So that's, uh, when a city's working, it works as a system. It doesn't work as six silos like that. But many people who are managing cities are required to think about one or more of those domains of a city at any one time. So it can be a helpful engagement tool. But when, certainly when the city's working, uh, the city has a footprint on our planet. And that's what we call an ecological footprint. It's a way of measuring uh, what we take from the planet in the way we're living. And we can do better in reducing our footprint uh, in the interests of environmental health. And down this axis uh, are, are what we would call in public health upstream determinants of health. The air, the water, uh, where we're breathing and drinking, uh, the exposure to chemicals, infectious agents, of course, local climatic conditions, uh, the food, uh, the physical activity, safety, violence, social uh, relationships at the family level and at the societal level. And in aggregate, these things determine our health and well-being, both the physical uh, health and mental health. And the point of a grid like this uh, is to help us see that in the cells of the grid, in these squares here, we can ask policy questions, urban planning questions, research questions about the links between these urban domains, for example, the transport system, and the upstream determinants of health and well-being.